everybody, I'm Gary Stern, uh, President and CEO of Stern Pinball. Um, and I thank you all very much for coming. I'm thrilled to be here. This is a great show. Um, so, you know, I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm happy that you guys are, are here playing pinball. I was exceptionally thrilled to uh, see the uh, Stern Electronics. Uh, I guess we're going to do the PowerPoint thing in a minute. That's fine. That's good. That's okay. That's all right. That's a good picture of me in a Mustang. Uh, I was really thrilled though, to see the, uh, the Stern Electronics games out there. I played most of them and, and a few that were all Stern Electronics games like uh, like our conversion kit, uh, and the, the Gamatron game, which is Flight 2000 as a narrow body. Um, I managed to prove that uh, conversion in pinball was not economically viable, uh, although some people tried it after me. Um, I'm going to talk for just a short while, um, and then I'll take questions about anything except what our next game is or the game after that or what happened. Because most of you know I won't. Uh, how many of you all have uh, either heard me in person or listened to some of these videos and heard me speak before? Oh boy, that makes it really hard. Okay, who wants to do the speech for me? It's the, uh, we can, you know, I, I uh, uh, you've heard me talk about history, um, pinball history, some of that stuff. I got some pictures of that you might have seen. Uh, you've heard me talk about our design philosophy, what we're doing, yes? Have you heard me talk about beer? How many of you have all heard the beer too? How many have heard me talk about beer? Oh, not that many of you. We're going to do a little beer then for a while. <laughs> beer is important. Beer is important because these new beers, the, these IPOs, you, know, you can get them in any amount of alcohol. And you go to the young people's places and they list the name of the beer and the amount of alcohol, you know, 5% uh, is a waste of time and all that. 7%, okay, 9 to 11%. I drink vodka, and so if my drink is this big, if my, my drink is this big, it's got 40% alcohol, it's got that much alcohol in it. I really have this up here to drink water, but it's a good demo. My beer is this big, it also has at 10% alcohol, that much alcohol in it. So this is no serious stuff, it's good, I like it. It works, um, it, it has something to do with, uh, I think Harry Williams, and some of you have heard this, he was working on a, uh, uh, a uh, game, uh, Hot Hand, and it had a big flipper, about this big at the top, and it would go in a circle, motorized knock balls out of little cups, and he said, the kids are gonna love this feature. And I put my arm around Harry and said, that's great, Harry, but your job is to get people drunk and keep them drunk. Because we were, we were in the bar business. We were in the uh, in uh, uh, street locations, and, and, and that was the basis of our business. So we'll come back to beer pretty soon. We'll come back to bars because I like bars. Uh, old game people, you know the uh, <laughs> there was a lot of drinking in this industry in the in the. 50s and 60s and 70s. We were we weren't a collector business. We were boy, I digress. We were a uh, uh, game operator business, and games were in bars. And game operators went to four, five, six, seven bars a day and collected the money out of the uh, out of the uh, games. And of course, they had to buy a round for the bar. So the game operators then went to see the game distributors who sold them the games and went out to dinner or lunch with them and they all drank and buy a round. And when the distributors went to the manufacturers, they all drank. It was a drinking business because it was a bar business. It was an alcoholic business, I guess. And United Manufacturing, which Williams, uh, United was uh, Lynn Durant's company and Williams uh, Lynn, I mean, Harry Williams and Lynn were partners at one time, and then they split. Uh, Williams had Williams Pinball, uh, or Williams uh, Manufacturing Company. Uh, Harry, I mean, you know what? Put the, put my photos up for a minute, would you? So we know what we're talking about here, just for a second. I'm gonna switch here. I'll just switch gears right away. We'll come back to Mustang. I have to write that down. Mustang. So I got beer, Mustang, and bars. Okay, 
we'll come back to you. Yeah, we're going to get the other one up here in a minute. So anyway, Lynn Durant was, uh, was United Manufacturing, and uh, Harry was Williams. They separated from each other. I'll show you Harry in a minute. Um, so uh, Lynn invented the shuffle alley, or puck bowler, in, oh, I'm going right in the trash bin. Ah, that's not Lynn or Harry. That's just a picture I like. Somebody once knew who that, who, what that was. Do you guys know what that picture is? I didn't write it down. Somebody told me. Okay, never mind. Next picture is, that's my father as a young man, younger man, fairly young, much younger than I am now. Give me two pictures past here. That's my father and Sam. That's Harry Williams as a young man. He uh, goes way back in the business. But he and Lynn Durant were partners, and I was talking about Shuffle Alley. Um, and uh, you all know what a Shuffle Alley is, a puck bowler? Everybody knows that. In 1949, he invented the Shuffle Alley. And these were for bars and for arcade, you know, penny arcades or whatever. There were not pennies at that point. He made 525 of them a day at United Manufacturing. And uh, they caught, he sold for $225. They cost $125 to make. So he made $100 a piece times 52, 525 uh, gave today, which is $52,500, or roughly a quarter million dollars a week, $260,000 a week. It was a big business. He, he died broke, but that's another question. Um, anyway, I started to talk about that for some reason. Uh, I was really back to, let's go back to, uh, we got beer, uh, bars, Mustang, Mustang, Mustang. Uh, now I'm going to jump you back for a minute. I'm going to jump you back and forth because I'm sort of dis, you know, that's my mind. Am I okay? Am I doing the right one back there, Jim? It's all right? Okay, we'll do Mustang. Mustang, well, first of all, car manufacturer is, some of you have heard me say this, but we're doing cars and we'll talk about why we're doing Mustang. But car manufacturer, Mustang designer, all of that is very similar in what we are, a pinball manufacturer. Why is that similar? We, are, we design games because we love games. These guys design cars because they love cars. But nobody does it just as an art form. Well, some people do, some hobbyists do, so forth. Uh, just because it's cool and, and what have you. But if you're really going to make mass, you know, mass volumes, you're doing it because you want people to play them, to drive them, whatever the case may be. And therefore, you must do them so that you can manufacture them. You must design the car to be manufactured, and you must manufacture it and sell it and so forth. You must have a business plan that says you're going to make money at that, so you make money designing that car so that you can have fun designing the next car. If you don't make money manufacturing, then you don't get to make another car. Same thing with pinball. We, you know, our job is not to design pinball. We are a manufacturer. We are first and foremost a manufacturer. We're an American manufacturer. We make our games in the Chicago land area where all pinball should be made because all the people who work on it and, 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 and design them and so forth are in Chicago. The people who own the tooling for the little plastic boat are in Chicago. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's where it is. And, and even when Atari made pinballs in California, uh, you know, when Steve Ritchie was out there, a lot of the parts, they came from Chicago. Uh, people have design studios for pinball in Chicago. That's, that, that's where it is. But it's manufactured. You have to manufacture. You have to have a business plan uh, that makes some sense, and you have to, have to make it. And, and, and the biggest part, the easiest part is the design. The hardest part is making them. Uh, the same with the car. So I mean, we see a lot of similarities. You guys trick out pinball machines. People trick out Mustangs or other cars or Harleys. You know, it's, it, there's a group of enthusiasts who love pinball. There's a group of enthusiasts who love Mustangs or Harleys. We, you know, you all know we made Harley. Same, same type of concept. Same kind of enthusiast. But outside of the enthusiast market. There's a bunch of other people who play pinball or would like to play pinball that we can expose it to them. And if we make it the right game for them, which we, uh, 
casual player, right? Game for the casual player. We'll tie all this together eventually. Um, maybe, or maybe you'll have to come back another time for me to tie it together. Um, so, we have a, a we, we have the same type of core player or core car collector and the same kind of not core people just, you know, they're going to drive a Mustang but they're not really be into it and collecting or what have you. I was looking on, uh, a, on, the web, on websites for cars for sale in Australia and I found about a thousand Mustangs for sale in Australia uh, ranging from $27,000 to $980,000. Something was very special about the $980,000 car. I don't know what it is because I'm a pinball guy, so I don't know what it was, but something was very special about it. But it's the same kind of thing. You know, you have people remake parts for Mustang, they make new Mustangs. You've got people who collect medieval madness and people who remake medieval madness. It's, it's just parallel. You know, it's, it's the same type of thing, just, you know, a different group. So why, why are we doing Mustang? Well, first of all, this is a, this is a picture of the new Mustang. It's introduced, its 50-year birthday is uh, April 17th, and um, um, they're doing, there's a lot of publicity and uh, a lot of interest, and there's a lot of Mustang collectors. There's actually, I'm sure you would, won't be surprised, there's more Mustang collectors than there are pinball collectors. There's a lot of people, and if a few of them can get interested in a Mustang pinball, then we've introduced some new people to pinball. Maybe they'll get interested in a Mustang pinball, and then they'll want another pinball. Maybe we can get some, you know, broaden our, our base. Everybody in game design tries to do the same thing, and that is, in, in, in all products, but especially game design, tries to broaden the player base. And, uh, you know, you want to keep your core players, go back to my father's day, uh, in, uh, uh, you saw a picture of him in his day, and uh, you want to keep your core player, but introduce new players, uh, and broaden the player base, so that first of all, you make more money so you can design more games, and second is to, in, you know, enlarge the whole customer, the whole, the whole market, so that you can continue and you can grow. If you don't grow, you go backwards. So Mustang, uh, this is the first time that it, it is a world car. And that means that it's going to be sold throughout the world by Ford dealers. Not just, you know, some people gray marketing in cars into Australia or something like that. Throughout the world. When they said a, uh, a, um, a, uh, a world car, one gets a little concerned, well, is it going to be uh, a littler car, a plasticky car, a, a Ford Focus or something like that, which is a fine little car, but it's, it's not a Mustang. The car, the Mustang itself, is about two inches wider, uh, a little bit lower, and as beefy as, a, as Mustangs have ever been. Um, if, can I have the next picture? Well, the next picture is a bit blank, so we won't do that one. The next picture. This is the Pro that is here. We are in production of this game. We've shipped hundreds of them into our export markets, and we're starting to ship them in America. How many of you have played the Mustang here? Ah, oh, good, good. The rest of you, please play the game. I need you to play the game. We bring it here, uh, we want you all to see it. Um, um, and this is the Pro version of the game. The, uh, give me a picture, please, the next picture. And that's the play field, which you've all seen. The cars, I will tell you, will all be, will be varied. Um, we get an assortment of cars uh, for, uh, uh, to put on these games, and so some are one year, some are red, some are yellow another year, um, but they're all interchangeable should you want, should a Mustang enthusiast want their own car, and if it's available, you know, uh, there's uh, two different manufacturers of these, 124 cars, and the game is set to accept either of those on it, so that the Mustang uh, uh, enthusiast can change his car periodically when he buys another car. If he can get that model in his color, he can change it on his game. Uh, the next picture, please. <coughs> this is the cabinet. You've seen all this because the game is here. So let's do the next one. And that's 
the play field, John Yalzi, uh, who does many pinball games, is the artist for the play field. So if we go to the next picture, and this is a SolidWorks drawing of, of the game. You've seen the game, but this is an engineering SolidWorks. SolidWorks is a three-dimensional uh, um, um, computer uh, design program uh, that's used very commonly, regularly today. Any of you familiar with SolidWorks? Okay, so everybody turn to the guy next to you and explain it to me. And then explain it to me because I, I, I couldn't do this. But, but generally, it's quite an aid because you can you, you, you really model things, you can make them work on the play field, you turn it, you can see what really fits and doesn't fit. With the pinball machines used to be drawn on a big drafting table on full-size paper. You know, with, in the modern days of, of, of drafting tables, they had electric erasers. That was a great advancement. Before that, uh, it was just a hand eraser. And, uh, so, and by the way, I took drafting in high school. I was horrible, horrible. My handwriting shows that. Um, but uh, Harry Williams, he was great. Any event, uh, uh, now it's done in SolidWorks. Uh, Trudeau, John Trudeau is the SolidWorks game designer who designed this play field. And for those of you who've played it, you, and those who haven't, you see that it's got uh, drop targets, it's got a spinning target, it's got uh, a multiple entry ramp and, and orbit area with a diverter in the back. Targets behind the drop targets, what have you. So you've, you've, you've all, if those of you who haven't played it, please go play it here and you'll see. Um, open, pretty good, you know, very open play field. I hope you all have enjoyed playing it. Um, and of course, then comes the other versions of it. So let's look at that for just a minute. Um, this is the boss play field, which happens to be the same as the limited edition play field. You'll notice that the car is now on a turntable that turns controlled by the uh, uh, button, the, the same button that you see on some of our other games on the front molding. And as it stops at different places, you're, you're uh, uh, picking different modes and features that you want to play. Instead of a post in the back uh, diverting the ball, it has two diverter gates on either side uh, of the lanes, of the top lanes up there. It has another diverter with a with a uh, wire ramp across the play field. Uh, and some 164 cars mounted on it, and other odds and ends, uh, other features on it, and. It, of course, has a different artwork. Now, the, the, the Mustang Premium is the Boss Mustang. What does that mean? Uh, next one, please. Um, boss, for Mustang enthusiasts, they know what Boss means. You all know what Boss Mustang is? Everybody's saying yes, it's a hot Mustang, so forth. So therefore, uh, this game has different artwork with Boss cars on it. This is an early concept. You've all seen pictures of it of it probably on the internet that were that when we send them out somehow they miraculously appear everywhere when we send them to our distributors i don't know how it is i haven't figured that out yet next picture shows the artwork again and the next picture will show you that the playful artwork is similar except it's different because all the cars on it that you're collecting in the middle down there they're all boss cars so they're all painted up different look different different years so forth and so on uh, and again, there's that legendary pinball illustrator, John Yalzi. He did this one too, surprise, surprise. Uh, but if you go to the next play, the next screen is probably, next one please, probably. Oh, it's not, this is, it's not the play field for the uh, premium, but the play for the premium is basically, again, the same play field, but back to the original cars that were on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, the artwork by Camillo Pardo, he, he is a famous guy among the Ford people, a uh, famous artist, and uh, um, uh, he, uh, he did the backlash in the cabinets. And then you've got speech by Tanner Falls, who uh, you know, does a TV show and is a race car driver. And with that, we'll go to the next picture. A list of the features that you all have seen out there. Uh, you've also seen, most of you have seen this stuff already, but again, you know, it's four pop pump just on the bottom part of it. And one of the things to point out is it has that uh, the Mustang on the back panel is a holdover feature, something that hasn't been done in pinball in quite some time. 
Uh, and for those of you who don't know, that means that, that if I got M-U-S-T-A-N and walked away, it's there for you to get the G the next time it falls over from game to game. Um, so, uh, um, should be attractive on the location for when people see that. Next one, please. This is the four songs and eight songs, four songs on the pro, eight selectable on the uh, premium and the limited edition. It's all good rock and roll, because you can have rock and roll with pinball. And this is the eight cars that are featured on the pro. Um, I, of course, like the convertible, because even though it's older, uh, all cars are good at the top goes down. My car's convertible. And, uh, Convertibles are very important. The suntan's important. Uh, I ride a motorcycle, I have a boat, I snowboard. It's all about suntan. That's all it is about. I look healthy. Inside, another question. Uh, next picture. These are clubs. I have to put this together for, for another country, country's use. Next picture. Now, this, these two pictures are real interesting. This is uh, at the Chicago Auto Show. And we, uh, in uh, January, introduced our pinball machine. We had seven machines there on the Ford booth. The car in the front is number eight off the, uh, off the Mustang uh, line. It's a, a 1964 Mustang convertible. It was purchased by a 22-year-old school teacher new. She was starting to teach. Her parents took her to the Ford dealer. There was nothing that they that they liked uh, in the front. So the, the salesman said, I got something for you in the back. It hasn't been introduced and won't be introduced for two days yet. So this young lady bought this car two days before it was introduced in Chicago. She, she bought it, drove it off, off the dealer lot that night. She still owns it. That's the same car, same owner. She owns this car since she bought it, the first one sold. Um, the pinball machines are behind it. But the other thing that's so interesting is the other picture, much more interesting. All of the people playing these games, young people too, very important that we had a lot of young people. We're introducing more people to pinball and part of Mustang, the purpose of Mustang, is to do just that, to get more and more people interested a whole set of people interested. You saw that I had Mustang clubs up there. Well, we intend Mustang club pinball events so that we can get new people into our community and into our customer base. We, we are in contact with, Musk, with car Ford dealers so that, again, we can get new people into, uh, 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 into uh, the uh, pinball, be interested in pinball. I have to tell you, some of them have as many Mustang cars as some of you have pinball machines. People are, you know, very, very interested in their in their hobby just as you are in yours. So if we can introduce more people uh, to pinball, this is one way we have to try and do it. We did it exceptionally successful with, successfully with Harley over a period of uh, eight years. Uh, Corvette, joined the design by uh, George Gomez, uh, was very successful in introducing more people to pinball. Many of you know that game. So, uh, to do all of this, we, you know, what are, what are we doing at, the, at our company? It says here I was going to talk about the future starter, update starter, something like that. Um, give you an, an update about it. Um, we, we're increasing our staff. We have to increase our staff. You all know that we used to make two and a half new titles a year. Mustang's one of them. For this year, we still make two and a half new titles a year. We will still continue to do that, and we have another title after Mustang that I'm not going to tell you what it is, um, just as I said at the beginning. Uh, but we will have, you know, uh, two and a half titles this year, plus or minus. Um, to do that, we found that we had to have uh, different games, you've heard me say before, from different segments of the market. Um, uh, for the uh, operators, for the uh, collectors, for the uh, enthusiasts. Um, 
and then for the uh, rec room buyers. Um, so we do make a pro, a premium, a limited edition. You would think that, well, it's very similar between each. It's similar, but quite a bit of changes, a new bill of material. Uh, it's not just a copy over because there are a lot of little changes to it, some cable changes, some new cables. Uh, you know, the lights, even though we're even our, pro, our pros are all LEDs today, it's a different LED package and uh, operated differently. So it's different cables. There's a lot of work between all these games. So what have we done? We are we're working to extend our design cycle from uh, whatever it was to put it, have teams, separate teams working on the game, sort of the old Willie way of doing it, Willie for Williams, the Willie way of doing it. Uh, and we uh, uh, have to have more staff to do that. We've added, uh, well, John Trudeau is the, is the playfield designer, the, the lead designer on, on, uh, on Mustang. Um, We've added a, a number of software pitch, uh, p, uh, software guys that are rules designers and not just coders. Uh, some of you who know Tanyo from uh, the enthusiast groups. We, uh, uh, we have a young man, Jack Benson, uh, who George, George was playing in Emporium. Emporium, that relates to beer. Okay, Emporium and beer, Emporium. Emporium, that's next to beer. Um, he was playing pinball at this at, at this location, and uh, there was a young man playing pinball next to him, and uh, he uh, they they started they were talking and so forth. And so George asked him what his favorite game is, and uh, I think it was Johnny Mnemonic, which is he says it's a little unusual. It's Johnny Mnemonic. George pulls out his business card, couldn't help him anymore, you know, because it was George's game. George Goldman is his game. So I said to George, this guy's a programmer, and, but he just loved pinball. He just graduated the uh, University of Michigan, uh, and he had a job program. And I said, you gotta hire him because that into pinball, because he could be a good rules guy. So, so Jack works for us now uh, because he plays pinball with George, or he did play pinball with George. Um, um, uh, Jim Shear, we had a Jim Shear, he came to work for us. Another pinball enthusiast who had worked at Willie's, cable designer. We, uh, we have the, you know, the, the, the bill of materials are so, we're manufacturers. My father started me, you've heard me say in the stock room, uh, when I was 16. You have to control the material. That bill of material, which is uh, on a one single level, is like 17, single level meaning we have a, a, a composite bill of material. Anybody in manufacturing at all here? Got, got a couple. Composite bill of material, and then you have the structured bill of material. The composite bill of material with 3,500 different parts on it is 17 pages long, something like that. No, 30, no, 3,500 parts, not 3,500 different parts, but it's a very long bill of material. The structured bill of material means it shows each part many times as to where it's used. And, you know, material control, we're manufacturers, material control. We're first and foremost manufacturers. Before we're game designers, we're manufacturers. If we don't design good games, if the car people don't design good Mustangs, they have nothing to manufacture. They don't make any money. They can't design another good car or another good pinball. But they got to make it well and they got to make it efficiently. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a business. It's all numbers. Business is numbers. My undergraduate degree is in accounting. My partner puts together you know, with all of us working on a business plan. Our business plan each year is only 72 pages long. It's that detail. And that's, you know, it's a business. And we intend to be here making pinballs for many years to come and have many, many more 72 page uh, business plans. So, any event, we've added, uh, um, um, more people in, uh, another person in, uh, in uh, Dimitri and uh, to, to do bill of materials, experience of that. Um, we have a, a model maker, Ken, we've had for about a year. Um, we're adding an EE soon, a new EE to our staff, as we beef this up to continue to build more and better games. But that doesn't tell us a whole bunch about beer. Now, we talked about needing different games for different segments of the market. You've all heard me do that before. Uh, we need all these people to design them, but we also need to uh, have some beer. 
We need to keep games in the street, uh, whether it be in family arcades. I yesterday had a meeting with uh, Tilt Time, time uh, uh, Nickels and Dimes, I think Australia's time zone. Nickels and Dimes, to, and they, they're going to try some pinball, it looks like. Um, you guys see here locally some pinballs in the movie theaters, I understand. Um, you have a, uh, a barcade here. Uh, I'm not sure if it's just videos or, or uh, also as pinballs. The barcades, back up. We need pinball machines on the street, and we need them on the street so that we can continue making games. We have three customers, operators, we need all three, enthusiast collectors, rec room buyers. And the, uh, if we don't have games on the street, it won't be a problem in my lifetime, but it will be ultimately in, uh, in, uh, in your collecting career because the rec room buyer is 45 year old guy who played pinball when he was 20. The current 20 year olds, if they don't see pinball on the street, when they go buy the game that they played, they're 45, they buy the game they played when they were 20, they're going to look for an old iPhone. Because that's where the games are. And, and you guys as collectors, you know, I, I've said this before, you go by the McMansion, door one opens up, it's Dad's Mercedes. Door two, Mom's Lexus SUV, these are rich people. Door three, they bought the kid a Jeep. Door four has a horse and buggy because Dad collects horse and buggies. No, it's got, you know, an old Mustang, or it's got a bathtub 356 Porsche, or, or maybe even a Ferrari. Cars are current, Dad collects cars. And you guys collect pinball, they're current. There's current pinballs, there's near current pinballs. You guys aren't so big on the EMs, there's some EMs here. But if there were no pinballs out there, there wouldn't be a new group of collectors coming in. And therefore, your big collection will dwindle down and, and instead of playing the game, you'll be telling everybody that pinball machine in the corner, don't touch it, it's an antique, don't touch it. We gotta have games on the street. We gotta have uh, leagues and tournaments on the street. You guys gotta, you know, could, could help pinball by not always having your leagues at home, but I hear there's some leagues that take place in one of these movie theaters. Go to the movie theaters, uh, uh, go, to the, go to the bars and tell them you put two pinballs in here. And every second Tuesday, we're gonna put, you know, seats in the stool, uh, stool, the seats in the stool. It's a, I, I own bars, seats in the stool. That's a phrase of, phrase of art, seats in the stool. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, and some of the guys will come in and practice. So, you know, that, we need to do that to, uh, to have games on the street, to have a future. Um, and that brings us back to beer. The, the way I started drinking this beer with the 9 and 12, 11% alcohol, and I had a bottle at, at Dorky's in, uh, in Tacoma when they had this the show that they have up there. They gave me this double bottle of beer and I was lucky to walk home. Uh, it, had, you know, it had alcohol. They tell me some of the Belgian beers are loaded with alcohol. But I'm really only interested in this beer when it's in, in a barcade. I go to a hamburger, hamburger place in Chicago with my uh, uh, younger daughter when she's in town. And they also have the, the uh, IPOs, the craft beers with the, with the alcohol content listed. So I, you know, I, I pick, it, pick it there. Otherwise, I drink vodka. I mean, if, if they got 5% beer, I, I don't know. Normal bottle, bottle stuff. So anyhow, um, the barcades, we see more and more of them in this country. Um, we have four in, in, uh, on the north side of Chicago now. And typically it'll have 30, 35 upright videos from the 80s, uh, Robotron, things like that. Easy to learn, hard to master. Young people, not necessarily gamers, they're coming in there instead of a DJ, they're coming in there, they're playing the games. And th these are important because they have beer, I know, because they have games. Um, and um, these are, I got casual written here, these are casual players that become interested in games. And not just, not just the games that are on here, many of which are easy to learn, hard to master, but they can be interested in our games. And many of these places start out with four or five pinball machines, double in size, they did in Chicago, and ended up with 20 pinball machines. And they're fun places to go to, as long as the games are easy to learn, hard to master, and that's what we're trying to do. Some of the games from the 90s were strictly for players, for you guys. 
uh, there, was, there were many players back then, but they were strictly for players. And uh, we don't have enough of you. We don't have enough players. Uh, we need to have the people, uh, you know, the, these young people play, you know, so they're 20 years old with a phony ID, shame on them. The, we want the 20 year olds to play the game, you know, to buy. We want to remember we're seeding this market so they can buy a home game when they're 45. And, and not one of these when they're 45. So we need them to have fun and not be frustrated. We need them not to have a 45 second game when, when the great players have 45 minute games. We have to level it out a little bit more chance and yet still deep things for you all to do. Easy to learn, hard to master. It goes back to my father's day at Williams and, and uh, so forth. And it's, uh, it's just what game design has to be, whether it be for pinball or any other product. So, we're trying to broaden the market with, with this game. We're trying to get with this game here. We're trying to uh, service all parts of the, uh, you know, all segments of the market. We're trying to get people and extended our design time uh, in order to uh, make better games and make all, all these different types, uh, all these different uh, models, the pro, premium, and, and, um, and limited edition. We also make uh, you know, continuing making our entry level game, the pin. So we're, we're busy doing all that to do it. We've added more people, and the whole goal of this is to get people to drink more beer. Now, with that, I'll see if uh, you all have any questions. I'd be happy to try to answer them. Um, we, we had somebody ran over, so we got limited time. Go ahead. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Hello. Uh, yeah, I believe you're right on uh, with your uh, collectors, with young people wanting them later on when they're older. And uh, that's where I fit into the market too, doing things that we couldn't afford to do when we were younger. Uh, but I think from the perspective of a homeowner, I've owned a few pinball machines, I, I've got them now. Um, you can find relatively many people that would work on pinball machines if you took it to their establishments. It's very difficult to get someone to come out and work on your pinball machine at home. Uh, and it's very difficult to get them in your home because of the size and the bulkiness of them. As a manufacturer, if you can do something to help them be more uh, uh, second market friendly so that maybe they're modular, they can unplug, you could take off the top portion without having to take both down with you as one unit to take them in for service or to bring them into a location somewhere, a second story would be wonderful for the secondary market for the ease of getting them back and forth for maintaining um, and also to put in your homes. Uh, thank you. There's two, two things I'll say and, and I'd like to address with that. First of all, I, I understand your concern. And, and years ago, the head used to come off the game, but it was a chore. Uh, you took off four bolts inside, unplugged some things. You can't take the head off of our game uh, just as easily as you could then. It just doesn't look like you can. You can, but you, don't, you really don't want to be doing that. Uh, it's a pain in the neck, too, either way that it was. Uh, either the old way or the way that we do it now and have for the last uh, decade and a half, two decades. Um, call 1-800-KICKERS and we can try and pattern Chaz will try and refer you, some of you to somebody locally who will come to your house. They have a list, a list of people. It still is difficult. We, our entry level game uh, is, uh, is not going on. Uh, it, they play great. We have a Transformers. And in Avengers, I especially like the Transformers myself, but that's me because I like out of bonuses. Um, it's uh, half the weight, just a little bit smaller, half the weight of, of, a, of a commercial pinball machine. And that's part of what we're trying to address with it. So I understand what you're saying. I don't know how to beat it with a commercial game. So that's why we, we're trying to market a, a less expensive nine point up, a little bit lighter, half the weight, a little bit smaller, still a full size play field. Not full size play field, full playing area on the play field. Same playing area as the games of the 80s, which is about two inches shorter than we have right now. So that's that's how we're trying to address that. But it's, it's a you know valid point. Any other questions? Who's that? Go ahead. Okay, here. No, she's got the mic. So she has the mic. We can't mess with that. And I got the mic. Thank you. As part of that, a 
fun to have that market force being a girl, and we make 80% of the purchasing decisions in America, although gentlemen, we still make more than we do an hour, don't worry. Um, would you consider, when you do the Iron Man update for the Iron Man machine for the third movie, would you consider changing it when it says, play again, sir, to say, play again, sir, or ma'am, so that I can feel like I'm a valued pinball player? You, you, you bring up a great, a, an absolutely great point. Let's go back to beer for just a minute. And I just like beer, guys. As I like the beer. So I'm going to go back to beer and tell you that at these barcades, you look at the barcades and you'll see guys coming in, girls, couple of girls, young ladies coming in as a group, them coming in, some in dates too. You also see I mean, when, the, when the, Gene Jarvis is the, uh, Eugene is the owner, head of Raw Thrills, which is a great video game company. He is the king of design. And he and I were going to headquarters Friday night. Uh, it was about 10 o'clock, and I had a flash of business card to get in there. I had such a line outside. Um, um, and, and sitting in the front playing Pac-Man, of course, uh, having Pac-Man that day. Uh, you see it on pinball. So you go to Emporia, you see, you know, young ladies playing pinball, just that. I, nobody, I, I don't talk about future games, so I can't tell you there's an Iron Man up there. Having said that, or, or not, but it's a great game. Having said that, your point is really important, and that is we are a, we are a mostly all over the world Caucasian male sport. But we are not, Caucasian male is not the majority. We've isolated half the population women, but also we've isolated, we need to attract other ethnic groups to our hobby. There's a few people at this show who are not white male Caucasians, and most of them are women that are either interested in pinball or with a guy who's interested in pinball. Um, but it, the, the, the point that you, is much broader than, than what you say, just you know, a few words. We need to broaden the base of pinball. Now, I tried something years ago that didn't work, and that was I put Spanish speech in pinball, and then the Germans saw it, we went German, and the French went in French, and the Italians went in Italian, and we were doing four languages that all started out for Hispanic bars in America. Didn't work real good except for when we made a soccer team game, which they call football, um, and which you can't sell in the rest of America for some reason. Um, the, uh, and it became you know, prohibitively expensive. As, as the business got a little smaller and so forth to do this. But I will, you know, something we tried hasn't worked yet. We need to address both uh, male, female, and ethnic mix on our, on our player base. One thing, if you have a Sopranos, and you need to get the speech chip for Italian. First of all, our Italian customers tell me it's great Italian, it's really translated, it's really great. But the second thing is, I don't understand the word of Italian. The game plays great in Italian. <laughs> you need to try this. It's really fun. It belongs in Italian. Yes, sir. Can I stand up? So, as, you know, as customers, we're seeing or, or perceiving a uh, quite a resurgence in pinball, or as collectors, how are you measuring that? You know, as a company, what are you seeing? Are you? Yeah, we, we see numbers. We see a resurgence. We see a resurgence worldwide. Our business is up. Uh, since, well, certainly since the Lehman Brothers recession, when we stripped the company and had to rebuild it, but business is up uh, and uh, worldwide, so we see uh, that, that there is a resurgence, and we see a resurgence, a resurgence, not just in our sales numbers, but in arcades opening up, selling beer. Okay, I, I'm really into this arcade thing and other street locations. Having games on the street tells us that, I mean, not everybody can afford at home a 5000 or a used two or $3,000 pinball machine. They need to be able to afford it by putting quarters into it. And that's how we have a broader base. Maybe they'll become collectors later, maybe not. Maybe there'll be games produced for you for later. There won't be if nobody's putting quarters in them. So, you know, barcades, beer, Regular bars, go to your neighborhood bar, take your, your group there that, that competes and they say, we'll bring our league every other week here. Get us two pinball machines. Yes? One last thing. 
As a teacher, I teach at an inner city school. My students are not white. Most of them are not girls. Um, so I was wondering, would you ever consider donating pinball machines to inner city schools that don't have outdoor playgrounds so that when we have to have an indoor recess for our students, we have something else for them to play? With the four player, it helps them learn how to take turns and play together and achieve goals. And it would be a really good way to broaden your demographics. That's, that's an interesting idea. The economics are difficult, but I can't say it, it would make sense somewhere. It, we, you know, we tend to do our charity in the Chicago land area because we're in Chicago, uh, but. Uh, not something for me to come back to here, it's for me to come back to. Interesting idea, we, we've, I'll tell you what we found interesting though, we have uh, uh, you know, young hopeful engineers from some of the schools that are not suburbanite schools, we've had tours, you know, in the, fact, in the factory, of, you know, is there pre, pre, whether it be engineering or, or junior college you're gonna go to, or college, whatever it is, um, we've had people, you know, kids come in and tour them and show them what we do, and show them some of the solid work stuff, as I'm saying, and, and what have you, and, and then we do that kind of thing. But what you suggest is an interesting concept. Interesting. Yeah. The line workers, which of your games have they found the easiest to learn? I don't know. That's an interesting question. Interesting question. I don't. I don't know. Um, though I will say that first of all, we're, we're manufacturers. Uh, we're Chicagoland manufacturers, and yeah, we've got an ethnic mix out in the in the, in, in the line uh, in, in the factory part, as we do in, in the uh, in the overhead group. Um, but some of these people have been making pinball machines. Our company was uh, started in 86, uh, so we're nearing 30 years old. Some of them have been with us since the beginning. Some of them worked on Valley's line prior there too. Some of the people have advanced. Uh, uh, if you were in Steve's uh, uh, the presentation yesterday, you saw Gabby doing bill of materials. Uh, she came out of the factory. Uh, Chaz, who some of you have talked to, was absolutely great. He was a final inspector in our factory, so you know they've moved up in, up in the uh, in, in the uh, organization. Um, so um, I can't answer your question, but I can tell you that see these people have been doing pinball for a long time, so I'm not sure that that they have that much trouble figuring out them out. And they're doing sort of a, you know a road testing usually more than playing. They know that they you know, when they do this, they should like that type of thing. Any other questions? I understand that you purchased the Ballet and Williams intellectual property rights, so whatever. No, we didn't. No, no, no. Uh, we don't have the Ballet and Williams rights. That would be planetary. Has them, uh, uh, and uh, Cunningham had so I don't know what the relationship between what uh, Illinois Pinball and what. Uh, uh, planetary has, but they're the ones with the Ballet Williams rights. Well, let me ask you what I really wanted to ask you is, have you considered uh, remanufacturing or reproducing some of the top selling tables from the... Uh, actually, Planetary is here with uh, Medieval Madness, which is not a top selling table, but it's a top table. What do I mean by that? Uh, it was not made in 93, 94 when the volumes were the largest. It was made substantially after that, but it is, is as most of you know, the, one of the most valuable pinball tables out there. They seem to be doing a, a nice job of recreating it, uh, and uh, so they are doing that. We don't make somebody else's tables. First of all, they have the they, they have the ballot wheels, right? So we don't make somebody else's tables. We make our own tables. We make a, a pinball machine for two, three years. Harley we made for six years, had to renew the license a couple times. Steve just walked in, we made Spider Van for God, for a long time. Uh, and so we, we make our own tables as they were. As far as totally redoing them, we did two different Simpsons, uh, totally different, unrelated, just the same title. Uh, but uh, we, 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 we make two and a half new models a year, 
in two and a half new titles a year again in the three configurations pro premium limited edition and that's that's our business model i hope i answered the question go look at medieval madness both the originals are out here and the and planetaries are here you'll see what they're what they're doing but again the price point of a limited edition or a remake is different than the operator price point for a pro game and you're playing a pro mustang out here which is a lot of game for a street game for the op for an operator all leds which i think modernized the heck out of a pinball machine uh, and there'll be more stuff in the premium and the le for the collectors and enthusiasts yes sir my question is i've got a 14 year old son who loves pinball he tried to get him to bring one of his friends with him all of them rolled their eyes how can you get your machines into places that are primarily ticket redemption, like the bowling alleys and David Busters, for example, where these kids that are 12 to 20 are at, not just the barcades? Okay. Um, we have a ticket redemption add-on to our pinball either ticketless or with tickets. We have been playing with it, I'm gonna say playing, because we're so busy restructuring ourselves and getting us into these uh, 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 teams and extended design cycles to make three different versions of the same title, um, that we, we, we haven't carried it as far as we'd like to. However, I have a customer in Australia, in Surface Paradise, which I didn't get to spend enough time visiting him. Uh, it's a, a very nice place. I flew into Brisbane, rented a motor to Harley and rode up there, so it was fun. Uh, but then I had to meet the head. It turned out they were having an international time zone uh, meeting there. Uh, but the reason I gave that I got them to test the redemption game is I knew that if anybody's going to get it to work, they did, and they did. And their redemption pinball. They have a pinball club. Uh, with uh, 70, 80 members that play regularly there, and they have pinball club machines here, and in the redemption area, they have redemption machines that make twice what the pinball club machines make, and make about what a ski ball makes. So we're trying to get there. Uh, it's, it's that, you know, that's, it, it, if you look at, at the FEC in America, it is a redemption location. I just know that yeah. I, th I think I think getting them in front of the kids that age is a good goal. I also think getting them in front of kids that are drinking beer is a good goal. I like that beer. Okay. Uh, by the way, no, no beer, no stock in any beer companies. <laughs> Last question. Does Dirty Pitbull have any kind of history relation with Chicago going up? Uh, with Chicago Coin. Um, Chicago Coin, uh, Chicago Dynamic Industries, DBA, Chicago Coin, um, um, was an old game company in, uh, a, uh, an old game company uh, uh, in the Chicago area. In uh, 1976, their bank foreclosed, I was a bankruptcy lawyer, their bank foreclosed, took over the assets, uh, and a company was formed, Stern Electronics, whose games are out here in a row, and it purchased the assets of, uh, of uh, CDI, and it operated as a pinball company and a video company until 1984, at which point the market had significantly deteriorated, and it, it, it closed. Uh, in 1986, uh, Dainey's Pinball was born, which is us. We uh, sold it to its 20% to Dainey East, 20% shareholder of Sega. In, uh, in uh, 94, I bought it from Sega in 99, so we just changed the name. So it is unrelated to Chicago Coin. Stern Pinball is unrelated to Chicago Coin, unrelated to Stern Electronics other than on Stern. And it is the same company, Dade East, uh, Sega, Stern, Pinball. Okay? Whew, that was a big explanation. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
I think I think we have to let the next person in here. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Are you the next person? Oh, Jim. Hey, Jim. I thought you were going to do mine for me. You said I, I did something different. Is that okay? Okay. Jim Schelberg is next. I thank you all.